Nothing has ever been used to control masses of people more so than Christianity's doctrine of heaven and hell. We're taught that life is essentially just about figuring out which religion is the correct one, and based upon that decision, you will spend eternity in one of two locations, eternal bliss or eternal suffering. You only get one shot, and ironically, it has nothing to do with being a good person. It only has to do with what kind of theology you believe in. Now, most of us acknowledge the obvious fact that all spiritual truths are not literal, but point to a dimension of reality that is beyond the literal. A dimension that transcends words and concepts, but that we are nevertheless forced to try and articulate within the rigid confines of human language. And this is not to say that words don't serve as useful pointers to that divine reality, because they certainly do. But at some point, the literalism of words and concepts must be transcended, and we must fall into the experience of that which is real. So in this video, I would like to unveil the metaphysical truths behind these doctrines and illuminate the spiritual reality that these symbols are pointing to. Because ultimately, if something cannot be experienced in any way, then it does not deserve our belief. You only ever hear what you are ready to hear. So if you haven't evolved enough yet, then a certain truth that might be obvious to everyone else will sound like absolute nonsense to you. When a person is still heavily trapped in dualistic thinking, then even the most basic and obvious spiritual truth, like only God exists, will sound like the most ridiculous idea ever. <laughs> but later, once their consciousness expands enough, they will feel like a fool for not having seen it before. This is the nature of spiritual evolution. And this is precisely why Jesus taught almost exclusively in parable format. This format is really efficient at communicating spiritual truths because by the nature of being a story, it challenges the listener to look beyond the surface layer. This is why Jesus said, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Jesus would tell a parable and then say to the audience, He who has an ear to hear, let him listen. Meaning, there is a deeper truth to these words, but only a few of you are able to hear it. And religion has heard the concept of heaven and hell, but has never for a moment understood it. But what if I told you that everlasting life is not a contractual agreement that we have with God through a mental belief system, but a state of consciousness that anyone has access to? What if I told you that heaven and hell are not geographic locations that we go to once we die, but dimensions of reality that we witness every single day? What if I told you that you have already been to heaven and hell countless times in your life? In this episode, we are reframing the view of these concepts to one which is not abstract and far off in the future, but as the present spiritual reality that Jesus was pointing to. The choice between good and evil, love and fear, heaven and hell. Welcome back to Moving Backwards, episode 22. Now, the first thing to get out of the way here is that contrary to what you've heard in church, Jesus never once ever spoke about hell, at least not the hell that we have invented from Christianity. As a matter of fact, the entire Bible never teaches about hell because hell is a doctrine from Norse mythology. And so if you'd like a more in-depth breakdown of this topic, I'm not going to belabor it any further in this video, but you can watch my other video titled, Did Jesus Teach About Hell?, which I'll put a link to up above. Jesus also used metaphors like a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And now he's obviously not talking about a place where people are literally crying and gnashing our teeth forever. He's talking about a dimension in consciousness 
that we go to when we deny the reality of God within us. He's talking about suffering. Now, suffering is not some ethereal underworld that we go to when we die. Suffering is a reality of our world that we are facing every single day. And there are billions and billions of people living in hell as we speak. So the question is, what did Jesus mean then when he used the terms eternal life or salvation or the kingdom of heaven? If religion is correct that heaven is a physical location, the question is, where is it? What is its longitude and latitude point? What is the square footage of heaven? Where is the boundary line where heaven stops and the world begins? The answer is obviously that the boundary line between heaven and earth is in your mind. Belief has nothing to do with righteousness and nothing to do with heaven. Righteousness is about learning to think the way that God thinks, learning to see the way God sees, which is always through the lens of love and non-judgment. The kingdom of heaven is not a physical location you go to once you die. Even Jesus himself said this. No one will say, look, here it is, or look, it's over there. For I tell you the truth, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Let that sink in for a moment. The kingdom of heaven is the awareness of oneness. It is a state of consciousness that is only accessible once we go beyond ego. The spirit leads us to heaven, but the ego drives us into hell. So how do we go beyond ego? The short answer is, once we can love everyone and everything unconditionally, just like God does. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must first deny himself. Himself meaning the false self. The ego produces hell because the ego is the belief in separation. The belief in separation is hell. It is the root of all suffering. It is the ignorance of love. And when we are ignorant of love, then the ego runs the show for us. And the ego then makes everything in God's kingdom a hostile enemy that threatens our survival. And so out of this fear, we create evil. When you believe yourself to be separate, you create your own personal hell. And then you inflict that hell upon everyone else. And this is the state of our world today. The belief that we separated from God 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden is where our insanity began. What Jesus came to show us is that we have never been separate except for in our thinking. Suffering occurs whenever peace is taken from us. The awareness of oneness is the root of all peace. And this peace that passes understanding, as Jesus called it, means that it bypasses the ego. The ego cannot understand it, which means that the ego cannot remove it. Heaven is a choice, because in order for us to experience heaven, there must be hell as well. Otherwise, there is no choosing and no free will. Heaven is joy. It is the state of total contentment and happiness. And isn't that what religion has always promised that heaven will be like? The error has always been in not recognizing that heaven is available now. And likewise, so is hell. The belief in separation is a form of insanity. Anyone that believes they are separate from God or anyone else is insane and requires healing. And now this isn't meant as an insult because we all require this healing at some point. Because the normal state of human consciousness, at least at this point in our evolution, is a form of neurosis, a form of insanity. Sigmund Freud defined neurosis as being separate from oneself. And since there is only one being in the universe, if you think that you are somehow separate from that one being, then you suffer from this neurosis. If you want proof of this fact, then you need to look no further than human history. If you were a psychotherapist who had to diagnose the human race collectively, then you would have to conclude that the human race is a violent, narcissistic, racist, sexist, genocidal sociopath. The farther back you go in human history, 
the more and more insane that it gets. But as we move forward and become increasingly connected, we are becoming more and more aware of our collective insanity and the sins that we have committed. Christianity typically says that sin means missing the mark. And while this is true, a better question is, why do we ever miss the mark? The answer is because our thinking is flawed. Therefore, sin is actually incorrect thinking. All sin begins on the level of thought. This is why Jesus said, if you've even looked at a woman with lust, then you've already committed adultery with her. This is also why he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word repent literally means to change the way you think. The kingdom of heaven is having a right mind, thinking the way that God thinks. This is why Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, Neither do I condemn you, now go and sin no more. Meaning, don't return to the same level of thinking which produced this problem. Change the way you think, otherwise you'll wind up right back here again. So to repent is to heal your mind, to change the way you think from separation to oneness. And this is what A Course in Miracles defines as a miracle. It is a shift in perception from fear to love. The word saved, as it's used in John 3.17, is the Greek word sozoed, which literally means healed and restored. The only thing that we need to be saved from is our own insanity. We need a healed mind. And you don't need to look for any further proof of this than to see just how pervasive the religious belief is in hell. I mean, the idea that God would torture his own children for all eternity just because they didn't believe a certain prayer is the definition of utter and complete insanity. That's just about the craziest idea a person can believe. But of course, any traditional Christian watching this video is going to say, no, it isn't. But that's what all insane people say. If you're truly insane, you don't know that you are, which is why you need healing for your mind. And so as somebody who has come out of this belief myself, I can attest to just how embarrassed and confused I felt at how I could have ever believed something so irrational and absurd. But when you deeply believe in the concept that you are separate from God, then this idea doesn't sound that crazy at all. Imagine if you saw a tree in the forest saying to all the other trees, Just keep away from me, you all. I've got to have enough nutrients to survive. If you don't back off, I'll tumble right over and knock you down with me. We would all say, wow, that tree is insane. Relax, tree, you're all connected to the same earth. There's no need to be so hostile. You are an extension of the source that created you. Imagine if you saw a wave cresting up in the ocean and crying out, Oh God, what's going to happen to me when I crash on the shore? Is the ocean going to torture me forever? You would say, wow, that wave is neurotic. From our perspective, the truth of oneness is obvious. The wave is the ocean. The tree is the forest. But because of our unhealed minds, we miss the ocean for the waves and the forest for the trees. The mind can make the belief in separation very real and very terrifying. And this belief is hell. But if you want to escape from your hell, whatever that looks like, the only way out is love. And God is love. And so this is the deeper meaning behind the traditional religious doctrine that believing in God saves you from hell. But if you want to escape from your hell, you first have to see it. You have to recognize the harm that you've caused yourself and others by holding this belief that you are separate. The choice is always within you. So how do we choose heaven? I'll give you the real criteria now. Ready? I cannot get to heaven if I am denying someone love. I cannot get to heaven if I am denying myself love. And I cannot get to heaven if I am denying myself peace by believing that I am separate. Love is the way, the truth, and the life. We do not convert someone by intellectually convincing them to believe in this set of ideas. 
we convert them by loving them exactly as they are. A Course in Miracles says that to teach is to demonstrate. So to teach the gospel is to demonstrate love. Love is the conversion. Belief in God is completely irrelevant. God is not a belief. It is our experience of God that matters. And the experience of God is love. Far greater is the demonstration of love than a thousand words of perfect theology spoken. Whenever you demonstrate love, you are declaring in time and space, this is what God is like. The kingdom of heaven is the awareness of oneness. So when you choose fear instead of love, you are denying heaven to yourself. But only what you do not give can ever be lacking. So you have the opportunity to give love to everyone and everything in every moment. And in doing so, to give heaven to yourself.